And going out, he went according to his custom to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was come to the place, he said to them, Pray, lest ye enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn away from them a stone's cast, and kneeling down he prayed, saying, Father, if thou wilt remove this chalice from me, but yet not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him, and being in an agony, he prayed the longer. And his sweat became as drops of blood trickling down upon the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why sleep you? Arise, pray, lest you enter into temptation. As he was yet speaking, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus for to kiss him. And Jesus said to him, Judas, dost thou betray the Son of Man with a kiss? So far the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Peace be to you and welcome to this our mission coming out of Egypt. I hope you receive many graces for coming tonight. I think most of the stings have been delivered. Our Lord, our dear Lord, our blessed Lord is sweating blood again. Our Lord is sweating His precious blood for these times because Egypt has made an unprecedented comeback. The occult is on the rise and being put to use even by children. Many enemies of our Lord Judas's have infiltrated even into the mystical body of Christ and are betraying him with false kisses, causing the church to enter into a passion, a time of great suffering and persecution. The state has joined these forces and are lighting torches and stirring themselves up to arrest and condemn the church once and for all. Alas, Egypt has also reached into the most intimate recesses of our own lives, regulating them in many ways as well as providing entertainment for our passions at every turn. Enslaving even the elect. People today love their bodies more than their souls. The Lord is sweating His precious blood again, and He is alone. There are none to comfort Him. Nearly all of His chosen ones, the anointed of the church, the priests and bishops are asleep. If not all. And that includes myself. While some of them are filled with sorrow and consternation at Egypt's return to power and prominence, they do little or nothing about it. Or they try to use the ways of Egypt to fight Egypt, which never works. It never works in the long run. The religious of the church, specially chosen and called to comfort the Lord in his times of trial, specially chosen to keep him company in the most blessed sacrament, seem to be among those who are taking the most delight in embracing what Egypt has to offer them, freedom to do what they want. Yes, These are tough times, especially for our blessed Lord and His church. These times have greatly added to His passion. He is bleeding and He is alone, just as He was in that garden so long ago. Yet these are also good times. Amazing. 
These are good times simply because he saved a very special grace, a most tender and thoughtful remedy for us who have to pass through them. He loves his bride. He loves the church and will never abandon her. Thus, for this age, for this time, he gives us his most tender and loving heart in a special way. The source of all consolation, the glowing furnace of charity, the delight of all the saints. Way back in the 13th century, the great mystic St. Gertrude once conversed with St. John the Beloved in a mystical transport. This is the very same disciple who laid his head on the sacred breast of Jesus and heard the sacred heart pumping and beating, filled with love as he gave himself at the Last Supper. He's the one that saw the heart pierced with the lance on Calvary and the blood and the water flow out. So St. Gertrude, rightly so, asked him, the virginal John, why he had not made known the wonders of the sacred heart in his gospel. His response? He said, such powerful mysteries were reserved to the last ages so that the world carried away by follies may regain a little of the warmth of early Christian charity by learning of the love of the sacred heart. What an unparalleled grace this is. Think about it. The opportunity to place our head on the heart of Jesus. The desire of the everlasting hills, the fount of life and holiness has been reserved for our time. It was on the feast of this same St. John the Evangelist over three centuries later, our blessed Lord appeared to St. Margaret Mary and made his requests and promises connected to his sacred heart. Regarding these visions, St. Margaret Mary explained, I understand that this devotion to the sacred heart was last effort of his love towards Christians of these latter times. By proposing to them an object and a means calculated to persuade them to love him, he saved his heart for us. In these trying times. As we know with Pharaoh at the time of Moses, Egypt hardens hearts. Egypt is the hardening agent of hearts. With the return of Egypt, hearts are more and more hardened. Once again, we know that Egypt has made its way into the most intimate recesses of our lives, even into our very hearts enslaving us to its pleasures. To counter this, our Lord opened up his side and revealed its most intimate recesses. Wow. His heart aflame with love for men. Only in heaven will we truly understand what an unparalleled grace this is. Before this time, he would only show his sacred heart to a select few like St. Gertrude, St. Catherine of Siena. Now he pulls aside his royal robes and displays it for all to see. What is our response? In the revelations of our blessed Lord, St. Margaret Mary was given the very means to overcome the present and future evils in France the very means which would preserve this eldest daughter of the church from diabolical revolution, a revolution that would break forth from France and go into all the world and lead to the communist revolutions of the 20th century and kill millions upon millions. In 1689, through St. Margaret Mary, our blessed Lord gave an explicit message for the king of France, Louis XIV, the sun king, he said, insert the sacred heart of Jesus into the coat of arms of the king. Construct a temple in his honor where the kings of France would venerate him. Make a consecration of France to the sacred heart. Request from the Pope as sovereign of France a mass in honor of the sacred heart of Jesus. 
Those were the things that Jesus asked. What was the response? Nothing was done for a hundred years until the imprisoned king, Louis XVI, remembered the request in 1792, shortly before he was to be executed. In desperation, he tried to fulfill the Lord's request for consecration, but it was too late. Thus, Egypt was not checked, but was allowed to grow and flourish. Constantine, let's go back in time, 4th century Constantine was shown the cross in a dream. He was told, make the cross his standard. And if he did, in hoc signo vinces, in this sign you shall conquer. And so he painted the cross on all his shields and swords and everything. And he conquered, he obeyed, and he conquered. He became one of the greatest benefactors of the church. He responded. Our Lord comes again. He tells the kings of France, the kings of France, whom he first anointed through King Clovis with a miraculous vial of oil coming from heaven. They're the only line of kings that were anointed. These are the same kings that the Lord saved from the English through St. Joan of Arc. There's been no more Joan of Arcs. These kings have a predilection in the sight of God. And here he is coming to them again, showing them how to gain victory over her troubles by giving them yet another sign. The most sacred heart of Jesus, crowned by a brilliant cross, set among raging flames, and they ignored him. Egypt was already at work in their hearts. They were hardened by sinful pleasures. Soon after the French Revolution ran its course, Napoleon took the throne, and he literally went down to Egypt. And he took a bunch of people with him, scientists, and Egyptology was born. The Rosetta Stone was found by Napoleon's men. And many things of Egypt were introduced into Western culture, including many things from the occult. As we said at the start of this mission, sooner or later, nearly all the big occultists found their way to Egypt, the home of the occult, seeking enlightenment, seeking experiences. Are we any different than these French kings when was the last time we read and meditated on the 12 promises of the Sacred Heart given to St. Margaret Mary? Have we made our first Fridays? Have we consecrated our lives? Have we enthroned our houses and our homes and our hearts with the Sacred Heart of Jesus? Have we defended His rights? What about the rights of God? What about the rights of the Sacred Heart? When our Lord showed St. Margaret Mary his heart aflame with love for men, he spoke these sorrowful words. He said, Behold this heart which has so loved men that it has spared nothing but has been poured out totally and has been consumed as a proof of its love. And for gratitude, I received from the greater part of men only ingratitude by their acts of irreverence and by the coldness and the contempt they have for me in the sacrament of love, the Eucharist. But what touches me closest is that the very hearts which are consecrated to me, the religious, act thus. Listen to a 19th century mystic, Blessed Elizabeth Canori Mora. Another time, she says, she was praying for the church and its ministers. At that moment, the infant God showed himself lying in his crib, bathed in his blood. A baby bathed in his blood. She was horrified. At this sight, she believed that she should die of grief and asked who had had the barbarity to reduce him to such a pitiable condition. And this is what he said. This is done by those very ministers for whom you are praying, the monks and the nuns who profane their holy habit. 
The fathers and mothers who instead of giving their children a Christian education, inspire them with a love of pleasure and luxury and fill them from their earliest childhood with worldly ideas. Our Lord is sweating precious blood again and He is alone. What is to be done? We must become consoling angels. Each of us must be a consoling angel. We must keep company with Him. Nay, we must do more. We must make reparation. We must seek to expiate and atone for our sins and those of the whole world. The consoling angel was sinless. We're not. He could console. We have to make reparation and console. The injustice and harm our sins have caused God cannot be overlooked. They go to his very heart, which has become saturated with revilings, crushed for our, own, for our iniquities and bruised for our offenses. The injury done to God must be expiated, such that the divine order which has been violated is reestablished. Now, how can this be done? Ah, how wonderful is our God. Wonder of wonders, the very heart that has been damaged so often and so much by men is the very means by which the repairs are done. We make reparation to the sacred heart of Jesus because his heart has been made the victim for our sins. It's through the sacred heart we can make reparation to the sacred heart. The people in the desert begged Moses for a solution to their sins. He gave them a type of the crucifixion of our Lord, the bronze serpent. Our Lord said in the gospel that when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will realize that I am. I am He. I am He who is. I am who am. That's what He's saying. When he is lifted up, he has the power of God, the power I am who am. In the, in the Psalms, King David tells us when we are greatly afflicted to do what? To take up the chalice of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Seems clear that the best way to make reparation for such evils perpetuated against the sacred heart, present most especially in the Eucharist, is through the Eucharist itself. If the Mass and the Eucharist are abused, then we make reparation for them, for these abuses, by offering Mass, receiving Holy Communion, and and making Eucharistic Holy Hours with the greatest reverence and devotion possible. So as a priest, it's my obligation to say Mass as devoutly and reverently as possible to make reparation for the Masses that are not offered that way. That's very pleasing to God. This is how we stop the seraph serpents from killing the people. This is how we take full advantage of I am who is lifted up for us. Now to be more specific, to be more particular, there are several things we can do to make reparation. Now first, we use the prayers and the acts the church has provided us. She has given us the Holy Mass and the sacraments. By using these well, as I've just mentioned, we make reparation. The Sacred Heart asks that we make communions of reparation on the first Fridays of each month. This is done by attending Mass and receiving Holy Communion as best we can. How do I do that? We prepare our bodies ahead of time by fasting and dressing modestly. We prepare our souls ahead of time by desiring to receive Holy Communion and going to confession frequently. We come to church early and pray to prepare ourselves. We should receive communion with great reverence, kneeling, and letting our Lord remain on our tongues rather than chewing Him like ordinary food. We stay after to make a proper thanksgiving of about 15 minutes. Now, the more that these kind of acts be done in the spirit of reparation, the more our sins and those of others are blotted out. 
such souls become consoling angels. God will reward them. The church has also provided many indulged acts for us to practice. Things like the Holy Rosary in front of the Blessed Sacrament. The Stations of the Cross making holy hours in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Acts of consecration to the Sacred Heart. These are indulged. They're pleasing to God. So when the church indulges these acts and prayers, she's telling us these particular things, God likes them, do them often. That means if they're used well, reparation is made through them. Now I hope you see the pattern. The more we conform our lives to God's established order, Found in what his holy Roman Catholic Church has always taught and practiced, a soul becomes more and more pleasing to God, more and more of a consoling angel. The soul becomes more and more of a delight. The soul keeps company with the Lord and doesn't go to sleep. Listen to Sister Lucia Fatima writing in 1943 on this very subject. These are her words. This is the penance the good Lord now asks. The sacrifice that every person has to impose upon himself is to lead a life of justice in the observance of his law. He requires that this way be made known to souls. For many, thinking that the word penance means great austerities, not feeling in themselves the strength or generosity for these things, lose heart. And they give up and live a lukewarm and sinful life. Last Thursday at midnight while I was in chapel, with my superior's permission, our Lord said to me, the sacrifice required for every person is the fulfillment of his duties in life and the observance of my law. This is the penance that I now seek and require. Sister Lucia, What is our Lord and his chosen one saying here? But simply this. We must conform ourselves to God's established order. To his laws as laid down so clearly by his holy Catholic Church. What is the first promise of those dedicated to the Sacred Heart? I will give them all the graces necessary to fulfill their duties of their state in life. Another important thing we can do to make reparation is to free ourselves from the influences of Egypt. Consider a furnace for a moment. Its purpose is to heat a house. To do this, its fires must be both contained and protected. We contain the fire. Why? We want the heat to be reserved for its proper purpose. We don't want it to burn down the house nor do we want it just to heat one part of the house. We want to contain it so it can heat the whole house. By protecting the fire from wind and other things like rain, the fire is able to burn more intensely. This containment and protection of the furnace is accomplished by walls and insulation. Applying this analogy to our lives... The house is our body, which are temples of the Lord. The fire is the love of God in our hearts. Its flames are especially fueled by the Holy Eucharist, but it needs walls and insulation. To provide this, we must limit our exposure to this world and all its smells, sights, and pleasures. We must work to limit Egypt's influence by insulating and protecting our hearts. Now let's get practical here. Go to Mass. Go to Mass, pray devoutly, attend the Mass and beg for graces to do what I'm going to tell you to do. And then go home and make a sweep through your home. Don't think too much. If you think too much, you're going to go back on it. Go in there and you clear it out as best you can of Egypt. Just throw it out. 
immodest clothing, gadgets you don't really need, bad books, TVs, video games, music. Throw them out. Get Egypt out of your house. Get it out of your life. The weight that will lift from your shoulders, you'll be surprised. And this effort should be something we renew frequently. What kind of Egypt-like things do I got around here? Every Lent, every Advent, we should be going through our homes, clearing it out. Too hard? Asking too much? When Our Lady first came to see the children of Fatima, she asked, will you offer yourselves to God to make sacrifices and willingly accept all the sufferings He sends you in reparation for sins that offend His divine majesty? Are you willing to suffer for the conversion of sinners and to make reparation for the blasphemies and other offenses committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary? Little children... Yes, we'll do it. And they did. And we're adults and we can. These were just little children. We're going to let them beat us? We must make reparations. Souls are at stake. Listen to the words of Our Lady of Akita in Japan. She said, the work of the devil will infiltrate even the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishop against other bishops. The priests who venerate me will be scorned and opposed by their confreres. Churches and altars will be sacked. The church will be full of those who accept compromise. And the demon will press many priests and consecrated souls, alas, alas, to leave the service of the Lord. The demon will be especially implacable against souls consecrated to God. We've seen this fulfilled. The thought of the loss of so many souls is the cause of my sadness. If sins increase in number and gravity, there will be no longer pardon for them. What is to be done, Our Lady added, with courage, speak to your superior. He will know how to encourage each one of you to pray and to accomplish works of reparation. I would like to end by showing you the power of making reparation. Power of making reparation to the Sacred Heart. By showing you what happens to those who organize their whole life such that they strive to do everything in a spirit of reparation. Okay, in a word, such souls make it to Calvary. They make it to the top of the mountain to die with Christ and they will rise with Him. And they'll help many other people make it there too. They'll have total victory. The Blessed Virgin Mary is one of them. She had no sins to make reparation for She was completely innocent. But the Sacred Heart came from her heart, the Immaculate Heart. She was the first to hear it and feel it beating. Being without any sin whatsoever, she nevertheless sought to make reparation for sins of others, nay, even for all men, for all time. She is the greatest of all the saints. She was there on Calvary making reparation to the sacred heart of Jesus. St. Margaret or St. Mary Magdalene is the other one. St. Mary Magdalene received a special grace from the sacred heart. Seven demons were cast out of her. She made reparation from that point on, even braving the ridicule of all as she washed and dried the feet of our Lord. She became the first after Our Lady to greet Our Lord on Easter Sunday. She became the apostle to the apostles and the prophet of the ascension. She had seven demons in her. She made reparation. And look at what heights she rose. St. John, the beloved, heard his heart beating as he lay his head upon the divine breast at the Last Supper. He was there at Calvary making reparation for sleeping in the garden. And initially he ran away. Yet soaring like an eagle, he wrote the most profound gospel. 
and saw many wonders and mysteries of time and eternity unfold before him on Mount Patmos. He wrote them down in the Apocalypse. They were all three on Calvary. They were all three connected to the Sacred Heart. Standing firm against incredible forces. When the bellows of hell blew their winds as never before seen or felt. Their fires did not go out. When others ran and hid under the mountains, they remained in place. They remained fully adhering to the divine order with wonderful results. Such a sweet victory can be ours too. And we need those victories in times like these. How do we do it? By making our life one of total devotion and reparation to the sacred heart of Jesus. Let us keep in mind that we're all sinners and therefore all of us here are obliged to make reparation. What a comfort it is to know that we poor creatures can, (laughs) we can do it. We can make reparation for the wrongs done by going to the sacred heart of Jesus, our peace and reconciliation. Let us then love God and seek to make reparation now for in the end. For in the end, there are once again two kinds of people, aren't there? In the end, there are two kinds of people. Those who make reparation now in this life. And there are those who make reparation eternally in hell. Our Lord is sweating His precious blood again and He is alone. Let us join Him and soothe and console His aching heart. O sacred heart of my Redeemer, may the love of Thy friends make amends for all the injuries and neglects Thou dost suffer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.